captivating from, from the start. Um, now to talk a little bit about how this uh, gets articulated across the language curriculum. Um, when you introduce major uh, figures, major authors, literary works, I'll just focus on that for the moment in this first point, at the beginning level, it does whet students' appetite for more. They kind of can see what's coming down the pike and they get excited. Oh wow, you know, next year or the year after, I'm gonna actually be able to read more than just a, you know, a verse of this or more than just a paragraph. Um, and it excites them. Uh, also, if you start by giving them authentic texts in the first year level, um, but approaching them with a very basic nuts and bolts, language focused kind of emphasis that we have to at that level, they actually develop real skills that they will then take with them into future courses at higher levels and be able to apply much more effectively when the focus at that point is more on discussion and interpretation than on mechanics. It's surprising to me always when I get third and fourth year students, and this happens all the time, who still haven't figured out after three or four years of Russian, but the first thing you do when you encounter a sentence is look for the verb because the verb will kind of tell you where the subject is. And it's things like that, just the very basics, that if you teach them that in first year Russian, they know it, you know, and it just becomes a habit of mind. Um, giving students the message that language, literature, and all sorts of other forms of culture, both high and low, are inseparable, um, this goes back to the quote from the MLR report, um, it can serve as an important motivator for them to move from one level to the next, and also for an inspiration for study abroad, because they recognize how much of real culture there is beyond the Notre Dame classroom that they want access to, they get hungry for it. Um, so that sort of integrates the program, not just across the curriculum, but with the study abroad piece as well. Um, and then finally, if you can integrate cultural forms such as visual arts, film, music, cartoons, etc., um, that will capture the attention of those students who are not, let's face it, literature people, because we have a lot of them. Um, so I try to do, even in literature classes, to give them paintings, to give them film clips and music, um, because that will just give everyone a little something that they enjoy. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about ways that I integrate culture implicitly into the classroom at the beginning level as well as explicitly, first implicitly. Um, uh, these are three different ways that, uh, that this works. First of all, you can integrate factual cultural knowledge um, into grammar and conversation practice just in the daily drills uh, in the beginning level. So for instance, if you're pra practicing compass directions, you can pick, in my case, Russian cities and say, you know, um, Vladivostok is located in the east, Moscow is located in the west, etc. It requires cultural knowledge, but what you, your focus is still on the language drill, but it incorporates that cultural knowledge, and you can incorporate that into exams, too. Usually in every chapter exam, I say there's going to be, you have to know something about this material. It's not all grammar. You have to know where the cities are. In that case, you have to know something about some famous people, be able to say um, Pushkin is a famous poet, etc. That, that they have to have, so it's not all manipulating the grammar. Um, so that's one way that you can do it. Uh, also using culturally authentic textual materials for reading and listening practice, internet maps, weather forecasts, uh, etc., etc. Again, the, the focus is maybe not on the cultural component, but the cultural component is just there in the background as you're working with the text. And then finally, you can use cultural uh, artifacts as prompts for active language practice. So this is something I really like to do. And the example I give here, um, I do use, and it works really nicely, is I have a, a PowerPoint presentation that's, that's just images of landscape paintings by famous Russian landscape artists. And so they're seeing Russian landscapes by Russian landscape artists. They're learning something about the artists just by seeing their work. They're encountering the landscapes and the way that they look. And meanwhile, sorry, <laughs> it'll, it'll come back. Meanwhile, they're practicing how do we talk about the weather in this painting, where's the tree, what color is the tree, and so on. So they're practicing their language skills on the basis of authentic cultural materials. You can also do that with people. If you're describing people, you can use paintings, you can use photographs to describe their appearance, describe their clothing. So I like to do that using those kinds of authentic cultural artifacts to do active language practice. Mm -hmm. Now on teaching culture explicitly, and the remainder of my presentation will focus on this. Um, 
you can teach cultural norms and expectations in the context of the thematic units that your textbook is broken up into. Um, so if you're talking about guests or eating meals together, you can talk about what you should bring for a dinner, dinner hostess in your target culture. Um, how you, if you're talking about shopping, how you would negotiate a purchase in the market, what the pitfalls are, what the expectations are, what sorts of expressions you might use, um, when to use formal and informal modes of address, and how that sometimes shifts as relationships shift, and understanding target culture, taboos, and superstitions. Those are just a few examples of the kinds of discussions, and at least in Russian, we do those discussions in English, because the students are nowhere near a level in first year Russian where they can do that in the target language. So it'll just be literally maybe a half a minute of just a real quick discussion or a quick bit of information that I throw out to them. And it puts the language that they're learning into a larger cultural context. And it makes it, activates, it makes it real, uh, actualizes it and makes it real. Um, secondly, you can, you can actively reflect on cultural differences as a group, as a class, in discussion on the basis of authentic materials such as film clips, advertisement, children's books, jokes, surveys, statistics, and so on. Sometimes, depending on how old your book is, there might be a dated um, element to this. So because Russia has changed so much, the book we're using is, I think, over 10 years old now. And so there's, for example, a chart of statistics showing what types of food the population of Russia ate most and least in like 1992 and 1993, which was the hungry years. And, and so we talk about, uh, you know, so okay, this was the hungry time, what did that mean? And what does it mean that they ate a ton of sausage, kolbasa, but they didn't eat hardly any eggs or meat and so on. And then I tell them, well, I, I lived there at that time and there were no eggs in the store and I didn't see eggs for six months and, you know, etc. So it can lead into these kind of really interesting either anecdotal conversations, historical context um, that, again, um, helps them put things in um, a really interesting and larger context. And then finally, um, you can assign, and I really, I always do this with beginning students each semester and I love doing it, you can assign them to do individual cultural exploration projects, um, where the way that I do it is that they each student has completely free reign. They just have to get their topic approved with me. Um, but they can do any topic at all, and I'll give you an example in just a second, of um, any topic at all that relates to some aspect of Russian culture that feeds into their own personal interests. And this is a way that they can take ownership of the language, take ownership of the culture, um, start to form some of the research skills that allows them to negotiate the culture independently. They might do research on the internet in the target language a little bit at least, which helps them with that. Or they like to pepper their presentation with target language expressions and terms. Um, and the way that I handle this is that they do five to ten minute oral presentations, usually with a PowerPoint or some other type of visual aid. Um, I've had students do Russian food and then they'll bake something and bring it in. So that can be fun too. Um, and we usually do these on the review days that I have set up before tests. So about 20 minutes of that period will be the culture presentations and then the other 30 minutes will be review for the exam. Um, these are some examples of topics just in the past year. So you can see the wide range that students have chosen. Um, sometimes I give them a little guidance if they're stumped or if they need to be narrowed down a little, but you can see the tremendous range of interests and different topics. The third one was really interesting. He was a biology student who's pre-med um, and did a presentation on Pablo's experiments with dogs that conditioned reflex, uh, reflexes and then linked that in with the way that the Nazis developed their propaganda system, apparently directly inspired by Pablo's research. So it was really interesting. Um, the hockey one was also, was this hockey fanatic from Canada, and he was just all about hockey, so he was so excited to be able to talk about hockey. Um, I, the, the Russian um, circus one, I think I put on there. Is that mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and she, she was fascinated with bears. So she talked all about the different kinds of things that bears do, and she had a video of bears um, ice skating in the rink in the circus. Um, that was pretty amazing, and um, they do all sorts of very, very interesting and creative things with this. So I love it, and they love it. And um, this is kind of the final portion of my presentation. Um, did the handouts go around? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have a handout that shows actually the materials that I use for each of these. 
Um, these are teacher-centered culture activities that I use, and these are four real ones that 